there's no turning back now. Let me offer you some proof of Jukti's betrayal. Uma Jukti's voice rings out, and as she had hoped, the machine cultists turn on her. Through the crowd, Jukti catches Mina's eye. I see you, girl, the old woman rants, and then she is lost behind a wall of knife-wielding cultists closing in on her. Time to enact the second part of her plan. Now, Barbican, she whispers, and her metal companion steps smartly into the brass box she has surreptitiously enfolded beside her, hidden in plain sight among the other tools. Defying all normal conventions of relative dimensions in space, the man-sized automaton inserts first one limb, and then another, and then finally vanishes inside the small metal box, and pulls the lid, too, after himself. Mina does not remain idle while he is doing this. She takes a fine steel mesh from a pocket and lays it over her head, where it snaps into place like an intricate wire skullcap. Her appearance begins to warp and waver, then it snaps back into focus, and Mina is gone. In her place stands a machine cultist, complete with a steel face mask sporting three circular green eye lenses. Ahead of her, the machine cultists are engulfed in a fusillade of ice. Time to make herself scarce. Mina scoops up the box, folding it swiftly down until it is a thin metal square only an inch or so to a side. More and more cultists pour onto the platform from all sides, hurling themselves into the battle with Jukti. Mina backs away, hoping to round the edge of the walkway and get herself out of sight. But before she has a chance, one of the cultists calls out to his companions. We are betrayed, Brother Cobbs. The Uma has deceived us. She means to destroy the great machine. We were fools to store the infernal powder in the great hall. Mina's stomach lurches as her back hits the platform handrail. They stored it here? A cache of explosives powerful enough to destroy the great machine itself, and they stored it here? The morons! The unbelievable, inconceivable morons! Oh, she's found the infernal powder she sought, but now she has a much, much bigger problem. How to neutralise it before that crazed ice witch and her horde of torture-happy goons burst in here and send the whole city straight to hell. She can make out Jukti over the din of the battle, ranting and raving about some damn thing, but she is suddenly unimportant. Mina knows what she must do. Gripping the handrail, she throws a leg over it, and then, unable to help herself, she pauses and glances down. Her palms go instantly clammy. The dizzying drop to the chamber floor below must be a good couple of thousand feet. This is a bad idea. But she has no time to reconsider. Behind her, a blizzard erupts, winds blasting outwards, ice coating everything. And in a moment of gut-clenching terror, her grip on the handrail slips. And then she's falling. Hello, and welcome to The Lone Adventurer, an actual play solo RPG podcast with me, Carl White. I will be your narrator, your game master, and your guide as we follow our hero, Mina Montessario, on her journey into the unknown. For this game, I will be using the D&D 5th edition ruleset, as well as a variety of other systems, tools, and tables as they take my fancy. A word of warning. The following scenes may contain mature themes and disturbing imagery. Listener discretion is advised. The adventure continues. Last time on The Lone Adventurer, Mina and Cadmus laid their plans against the pipe runners, and then Mina and Barbican were escorted by Jukti to the Hall of the Great Machine. Once there, Mina put her plan into action, using Jukti's own words against her to exploit the tensions between her and the machine cult. A terrible battle ensued, and when it ended, neither Jukti nor Mina were anywhere to be seen. Several things go through Mina's mind as she falls a tiny speck hurtling past the seemingly infinite mass of the machine. 
The first is the thought that she really, really hates heights, and that repeatedly throwing herself into freefall is doing nothing to improve that. The second is that dry little voice at the back of her mind, always crunching the numbers. Did you know that with a fall from this height, it's going to take a little over 15 seconds for you to hit the ground, by which point you'll have hit terminal velocity and will be travelling at around 112 miles per hour, assuming you maximise your air resistance? She pushes the thought aside, focusing on more urgent things, like stopping herself from hitting the ground at 112 miles per hour. Frantically, she buttons her coat, clumsy fingers fumbling at the buttons as the wind whistles past her. It doesn't help that she can't actually see her clothing. Thanks to her artificing, the greatcoat currently looks like a set of tattered cultist robes. The last time she tried this trick, using a short brass rod to counteract the effects of gravity, she came very close to pulling her arms from their sockets and spent the whole journey down terrified that her grip would slip. She's upgraded since then, but that upgrade does rather depend on her hanging on to her coat. With the coat finally buttoned tight, she slaps both lapels hard. Nothing happens. Oh, come on, she groans, slapping again at the lapels harder this time, and then her coat slash robes light up with glowing blue symbols. Her descent instantly slows, and the panic that had been rapidly mounting begins marginally to subside. Gazing at the side of the machine, she sees cultists swarming like ants up its bulk. She reaches into a pocket and grips the hexagonal nut, focusing on Cadmus, and forms words in her mind. Plan worked, sort of. They're at war. But Jukti escaped, and she's coming. Get out, now! Oh, and explosives beneath the great machine. Working on it. She waits for a few moments, then hears Cadmus's voice in her mind. Understood. You focus on the powder, Mina. I'll keep Jukti occupied. Then the link goes dead. No, 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 that wasn't the plan. What are you doing, Cadmus, she calls out, though she knows that the sending magic is spent. Get out of there, you idiot! She knows what he's doing, of course. Buying her time, using himself as a distraction. Playing on Jukti's volatility and sadism to grant Mina enough time to secure the powder and to somehow make it safe. But at what cost? He knows what Jukti will do to him. Her eyes well up at the thought of what Cadmus' sacrifice might mean. She shakes her head furiously in the futile hope that, by denying it, she can somehow undo it. But she knows it's a lie. The ground comes rushing up to meet her, and she braces for impact. She had hoped to see some evidence of the powder down here at the chamber floor, but she sees no barrels. Instead, she sees a group of machine cultists pointing up at her and running to intercept. She lands the impact softer than she was anticipating. The fine-tuning seems to have done the job, though the activation trigger could certainly use some work. Overhead, klaxons continue to blare, audible above the heavy thrum of the machine. You! Stand where you are! The cultist strides towards her, with several more at his heels. They fan out, hands on the hilts of their weapons. Those magics are not of the great machine, he says, indicating the fading blue sigils on her robes. Who are you? State your part, Brother Cog. He draws a notched machete and raises the tip to her throat. State your part number or die. Well, bugger. Out of the frying pan and straight into the fire. Poor old Mina, she just can't seem to catch a break. Before I get into what happened in that scene, as well as some of the mechanics of her escape in the teaser, it's worth giving a quick update on our plot threads. Last session, I removed Track Down the Infernal Powder, and in light of Mina's successful vanishing act and spot of base jumping, I think it's reasonable to also remove Escape the Pipe Runners. In place of those two threads, I've added in War in the Underpipes, and Neutralize the Infernal Powder. There are other things I could add, but those two seem to be the most pressing right now. Also, let's touch briefly on the size of the Hall of the Great Machine. As a result of some of the mythic roles, we've learned the chamber is far bigger than could possibly fit below the city. How and why that is the case will no doubt be explained in time, but I am glad it cropped up. 
I had the sense during Mina's first foray into the underpipes that the scale of the place exceeded the available space. Given that there's a big hole in the middle of the chain link, the actual surface area of the city is comparatively small, so confirmation that it's bigger on the inside nicely frees up this mega dungeon to be as big as it needs to be, unconstrained by the laws of physics. Okay, so back to Mina's plan. It was pretty straightforward, really. First, she snuck out her bag of holding, which she created using one of her replicate magic item abilities. And to do that without getting spotted, she made a sleight of hand check, with advantage due to Barbican carrying out the help action. Basically, he stood in the way. Even with advantage, Mina just barely squeaked past the cultist's passive perception of ten, but she did manage it. And then she made her natural 20 roll on a persuasion check, aided by the recording of Jukti. And finally, she made a stealth roll to cast the Disguise Self spell on herself without getting spotted. I'd figured that with Barbican in the way, and with a raging battle kicking off, I could have got advantage on that roll, but I got a random event when asking if the cultists attacked Jukti, which was NPC positive for Jukti, with the description Inspect Travel. Jukti was laser-focused on her travelling companion. Now, in 5e, the advantage rules are elegantly simple. Something circumstantially positive adds advantage, meaning you roll 2d20 and take the best, and something circumstantially negative adds disadvantage, meaning you roll 2d20 and take the worst. And if there are any number of effects in either direction, they cancel each other out, and there's neither advantage nor disadvantage, just a straight roll. This little mechanic is probably my single favourite innovation in 5e. A really clean, intuitive bit of game design that has a meaningful impact on roles and is incredibly easy to understand and implement in any number of situations. Except, of course, it's not entirely a 5e innovation. Advantage, or at least its precursor, made its first proto-appearance in 4th edition D&D. The Avenger class from that edition had a power called Oath of Enmity, that allowed the rolling of 2d20s and picked the best. Anyway, without advantage, Mina failed on that roll, and so I burned a hero point to re-roll it, and this time she did succeed. From there, I sent her over the edge in search of the Infernal Powder. She cast the Featherfall spell, and then used her Sending Stone, created with the second Replicate Magic Item ability, to contact Cadmus. That send and receive function is just once a day, so that's the last time they'll chat for a while. Now, I faced a choice here. I've stated before that I consider Cadmus a PC, but he's not the main protagonist of this story, he is a sidekick. So, because he was off stage, I decided not to roleplay him, but to leave his response up to my virtual GM. Part of the fun of playing this game is to run up against the unexpected, and what happens next was certainly unexpected. Mythic told me that Cadmus replied, but that the reply was not the one Mina was expecting. I asked for some explanation of this, and Mythic provided the cryptic response, Refuse good. I interpreted that as refusing the plan for the greater good, which seemed in character for the selfless healer, and another good way to ratchet up the emotional stakes for our hero. And, of course, from there, the wheels really did continue to come off. Did she see the cache of explosives she was seeking? No. Did she land unchallenged? No. Was it cultists? Yes. And was it loads of them? Of course it was. Straight back into the fire, then. Chaos goes up to six. Ah, yes. Um, part number. Look... You hear those sirens from up there? Well, those are because Uma Jukti, the leader of the Pipe Runners, has attacked and killed a whole load of machine cultists because she wants to blow up the great machine using all of the infernal powder that you have stashed down here. She glances about, which I've come to secure because we should expect an all-out attack from the Pipe Runners at any moment. Um, so if you could just point me in the right direction? The machine cultists' masks are utterly featureless, but somehow the gathered group manages to look completely unconvinced. Frankly, based on that performance, Mina wouldn't believe her either. The leader presses the tip of his machete harder against Mina's throat, drawing a drop of blood. Fleeing the sacred klaxons, you descend the height of the great machine using strange and unfamiliar magics. 
You request access to this Sector Sirup deal without even a pass number, let alone a valid one. And, despite your garb and your holy headpiece, you speak without the voice of the machine. Your attempt at deception would be laughable, were laughter not a failure of the flesh and forbidden under machine doctrine. Give me one good reason not to slay you where you stand. Mina has to confess, he has her there. One good reason, you say? Uh, Well, now... There's a sudden twang, and the head of a crossbow bolt appears, protruding from the machete wielder's chest. He and Mina stare down at it in equal confusion. Behind him, one of the machine cultists strides forward, tossing a crossbow aside and twirling a spear flamboyantly in one hand. Well, the cultist says in the decidedly non-machine cultist voice, you just got to stand there, gulping, love. Grab his weapon and lend a hand, eh? Their appearance begins to blur and warp, and in an instant the cultist is gone, replaced by a tall, athletic woman with red skin, bright yellow eyes, and a pair of glossy black horns curling back over her brow. She grins, and with a showy backhand plunges the spear into the stomach of the cultist standing next to her. She turns and kicks the dying man off the end of the spear, sending him sprawling into a companion. Any time, when you're ready. The cultists recover their wits before Mina does. Blades are drawn, and with exhortations to their mechanical maker, they attack. They descend upon the spear wielder, blades flashing, but their target moves like quicksilver, weaving and ducking, the spear constantly spinning. The movements are more like some exuberant dance than any combat form Mina has ever seen and she talks throughout a non-stop chatter of meaningless, distracting patter. Mind yourself there. Left a bit, mate. Right a bit. That's it. Don't move. Oh, that's gotta hurt. Mina uses the distraction to fish out the folded box from her coat pocket. She opens it swiftly, reaches in and grabs Barbican's hand. Out you come, Barbs. Help the nice red lady, would you? The horned woman does a backflip, rolls neatly across Barbican's back, and plants a well-aimed kick into a lone cultist's balls. He doubles over with a whimper and tries feebly to scrabble away. There's no denying it, that's a shit way to go, mate, she says as her spear tip skewers him from behind. She leans on the spear for a moment, inspecting her nails, and then the pack of cultists is after her again. One makes a passing stab at Mina, who stumbles backward in panic, only for Barbican to step in and have the blow clang harmlessly off his metal hide. Thanks, Barbs, she says, grabbing up the fallen machete and swinging wildly. The cultist, turning to fend off another attack from the spear wielder, goes down screaming with a brutal wound in his back, falling into an ally who is knocked off balance and into Barbican's waiting arms. The automaton's fists, crackling with blue energy, slam into his head and the body spasms and thrashes for a moment before falling limp. Hey, not bad, Clanker, the warrior grins, ducking casually under a knife thrust and then flinging her spear into her attacker's throat. You've got style. She snatches the weapon back and drives the heart backwards, shattering the cultist's knee. You ever consider their career in the pits? He's got a job, thank you. Mina swings just as a cultist runs past her and it takes his head off. Barbican holds out a rigid metal arm and clotheslines another, snapping his neck cleanly. The horned warrior turns and hurls her spear in one smooth motion, missing Mina's head by inches and impaling the cultist sneaking up behind her through the eye. You're welcome, the horned woman grins, offering a flamboyant bow. The name's Antiope, by the way. Now, what was that you were saying about pipe runners? and high explosives? Although my virtual GM spends most of its time gleefully making bad things worse, there are occasions where it throws me a bone. As in this scene, to kick things off, I checked for scene alteration and got Introduce New NPC as an interrupt. The description of this NPC was Kill Nature. Well, ever since Cadmus mentioned the gladiator that he freed back in Chapter 10, I'd been hoping for an excuse to introduce Antiope. I knew she might still be alive down here somewhere, and so when I got that interrupt, it could only be one person. A killer by nature? That sounds like our rogue pit fighter to me. But who is Antiope? What makes this weapon master tick? Well, first up, 
I wanted a personality for her, and for that I turned to my patent-pending canoe personality generator. Rather than pick values as I did for Ukti, this time I wanted some randomization, but I also wanted some degree of control over the outcome. And so to achieve the random part, I rolled 5d10 and halved the results giving me 5 values from 1 to 5. Those were 4, 1, 1, 2 and 3. And then, to give me the control part, I assigned these values to the attributes I felt fitted her best. I find it easiest when doing this to assign the strongest trait first, the weakest trait second, and then just fill in the remainder. And here's what I ended up with. Conscientiousness. 1. Organisation and structure are for suckers. She goes with her gut, when she likes, where she likes, and screw the consequences. Agreeableness. 3. She's not an empath by any stretch, but she's not especially antisocial either. Neuroticism. 1. She's steady as a rock. She lives in the present and has no time for navel-gazing. Openness. 2. She's actually pretty conservative in her worldview. She knows what she knows, and everything else is pretty much irrelevant. She's no abstract or lateral thinker. And finally, extroversion. 4 for this one. She's at her best when she's the centre of attention, basking in the adulation of the crowd. Next up would be to figure out what she wants by rolling some une motivations. But I think I'll roll those when the fiction requires it, so I'll park that for now. What I do need is a character sheet for her if we're going into combat, and so I've turned once again to the sidekick rules in Tasha's. This time I've picked an attacker-warrior, using the thug template for a big stack of hit points and multi-attack. And just to mix things up, I've decided I want Antiope to be a tiefling. So, after looking at a couple of sample tiefling fighter character sheets, I'm throwing in a disguised self infernal legacy, which you can use once a day. A side note here. I've stumbled across a wonderful website for instant character generation. Next time you have an extra person show up for a game session and you want a quick character, or if you just want to run an impromptu one-shot, or if you're just not in the mood to spend ages prepping a character for your DM's next campaign, give fastcharacter.com a try. You can go full random, or put in as many elements as you like, things like class, race, level, and so on. Then just hit the Generate button, and voila, instant character. Now, they're not going to be necessarily fully optimised, but that's okay. They're going to be perfectly viable in play, and some of the unexpected combos that come up really do spark the imagination. As an example, I just rolled randomly three times, and the first character I got was Inverter Unit 86V, a rogue Modron light cleric, Delvano, a Circle of the Shepherd Githyanki Druid, and Dwanoi the Accursed, a tiefling Gloomstalker Ranger. Looking at those combinations, combined with their backgrounds, traits, ideals, bonds and flaws, well, each seems filled with fascinating backstory potential. It really is an amazing resource. Anyway, back to our scene. Uh, back to form, Mina rolled a 5 on a persuasion check to convince the cultists to help her, and so I rolled to see if Antiope would intervene on her behalf. And thank goodness she did. Cue combat. I kicked things off with Antiope scoring an auto-kill with her crossbow. Now This was purely narrative rather than mechanical, It took place before the initiative was even rolled and had absolutely no chance of failure. You might wonder how that's fair. Shouldn't Antiope have rolled to see if she hit and then rolled damage? Well, this, once again, is DM window dressing. I'd already determined that there were eight machine cultists they would have to fight, and so I simply added another one for Antiope to murder from behind. A dramatic beat, a cool intro to a new NPC, and no impact on the overall combat. The trick is not limited to lunatics recording solo D&D podcasts in their sheds. Any NPC on NPC action can be narrated like this by the DM in any game. The DM may even wish to extend that feel-good first kill to PCs. Let's say that you're the DM and you tell your players, the bandit strides over to you and demands your coin purse. His companions are hanging back, nursing their cudgels. What do you do? And the barbarian player says, screw this, I want to kill him. Should I roll for initiative? In a minute, you say. First, describe the cool way that you kill this idiot. What the PCs don't know is that the coin purse demanding idiot is just a phantom, a ghost. 
Without their noticing it, another bandit has been added to the mob standing behind him, leaving the combat encounter exactly the same as originally planned, but starting things off with the barbarian looking like a badass. On the topic of everything not being quite as it seems, it may not have been apparent in that last scene's combat description, but Antiope was losing hit points hand over fist in that battle. Cultists were actually scoring multiple hits on her. Now, it can be quite easy to equate hit points completely with wounds and physical damage, but in D&D, hit points can be a lot more abstract than that. The 5e rules state, hit points represent a combination of physical and mental durability, the will to live, and luck. In Antiope's case, where she's a flamboyant, stylish fighter, I wanted her dancing through the battle in the fiction, barely taking a scratch, pulling off outrageous moves, but while doing so, she was burning through her stamina and riding her luck. She was staying one step ahead of the enemy, but the longer she went on, the closer she was getting to taking that lethal blow. Now, if Antiope were instead a big, slow, brutish thug relying on brute force and endurance to hack her way through the enemy, I would have described things very differently. She would probably have been taking glancing blows, nicks and bruises, but shrugging them off and powering her way through. Mechanically, in terms of hit point loss, it would be exactly the same. The D&D hit point system can come in for a bit of stick, but I think that if used creatively that abstraction can be narratively very liberating. Anyway, beyond all expectations, that scene actually went pretty well. Chaos goes down to three. Let's see what happens next with Antiope. Antiope? You're the gladiator that Cadmus rescued from the blood pits. Nina had suspected as much. How many showboating combat masters could there be down here? That's right, Antiope replies, searching the bodies of the fallen for loot and weapons. The best she manages is a short sword and a couple more daggers. Greatest gladiator ever to grace the blood pits, that's me. So you know the Colossus botherer, eh? Well, how's the old fella doing? Mina had been doing her best not to think about that. Not good. The pipe runners have him, and their leader is planning to torture him to death. She pauses, and then adds, Because of me. The stab of guilt she feels at this admission is palpable. This is her fault, and the price Cadmus may pay is far too high. Antiope cocks her head to one side. Sounds to me like you should be doing something about that then, no? Mina feels torn. I I want to, more than anything. But if I don't stop what's about to happen here, there'll be no Cadmus left to rescue. There'll be no one at all. Uma Jukti means to blow the machine sky high and the whole city with it. You mean that wasn't just a load of bunkum you were feeling those bucket heads? Well, who'd have thunk it? Antiope shoulders a pack and turns to leave. Well, best of luck, love. Sounds like you're going to need it. Mina can't believe it. Wait, did you hear what I just said? If I don't make the infernal powder safe from those pipe runners, the whole damned city's going to burn. Antiope shrugs. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. Sounds like suicide either way to me. Do your best, eh? And she begins to stride away. Hold on. If you won't help me, then at least help Cadmus. He got you free from the blood pits. You at least owe him the same in return. Antiope stops and turns. The deal was... I showed him the way down here, and he got me free. Seems to me that that deal is done. And it seems to me that you got rather the better of that deal, Mina snaps. You're free from the pits, and he's captured by torturers. Listen, I can't be in two places at once, and he's going to die in agony without one of us. If you won't help me, please help him. Antiope looks to the roof of the Great Hall and closes her eyes. Gora's black iron balls. Damn it, fine, I'll go rescue the Burke, but after that we're quits, understand? No more guilt trips. And she stalks away, spear over her shoulder. Mina lets out a sigh of relief. Well, I suppose that could have gone worse, she says to Barbican, running skilled fingers over his chassis. Runes flare into life, and small dents and scrapes begin to auto-repair. If anyone can rescue Cadmus, I'm guessing it's her. Now then, if we want the city to still be standing come tomorrow, 
We're going to need to find this Sanctus Eruptio before Jukti does. Come on! You have been listening to The Lone Adventurer, a solo RPG podcast played, written, and performed by me, Carl White. If you've enjoyed this episode, please consider leaving a five-star review or telling your friends. It really is a huge help. You can find show notes at theloneadventurer.podbean.com. I include any links mentioned on that site, as well as my interactions with the Mythic GM emulator and any mechanics information. The story will continue in the next episode of The Lone Adventurer. Thank you for listening. <laughs>